All right, so last week we saw that Saul, be, we met Saul. He's chosen as king, and Samuel anoints him as king. This week we get to see Saul in action, his first work of salvation for the people of Israel. And that's what we're going to consider. So from this long passage we read, we're just going to have two points. First, Saul the prophet. And second, Saul the Savior. And then we'll have four applications at the end. So, first, Saul the prophet. Okay, so, remember, Saul is looking for the donkeys of his father. He's not looking for anything special. He ends up meeting Samuel, and Samuel tells him that he's going to be king. And he anoints him king over Israel, and then sends him on his way. And before he leaves... Samuel the prophet tells him exactly what's going to happen. When you get to Rachel's tomb, you meet a couple cats, and you're going to go on further, meet these people, they're going to give you bread. And you're going to go on further, you're going to meet the prophets that are coming down in Gibeah, praising and worshiping the Lord. And the Spirit of God will come upon you. And then I'll meet you later for sacrifices, and I'll appoint you as king. So, so Saul leaves Samuel, and all this stuff begins to happen. He meets, he, meets, he meets all the people, and then he meets the prophets that come down. So, uh, so this is the context is he's just been anointed by Samuel. That is where oil was poured over his head and, and run, run down his beard. And this was a sign of God's choosing and blessing and empowering Saul to be the king of Israel. The high priests were anointed and kings were anointed. And the oil didn't do anything special in and of itself, sacramental in a way, but it symbolizes the empowering of God's spirit that was going to come on Saul. And that's what happens immediately is when he meets the prophets, the spirit of God comes upon him. So what's the deal with this prophet business? Okay, so these prophets come down. Who are these prophets here? Uh, we thought Samuel was the prophet in Israel. Well, Samuel's the prophet if you want to go to a guy and ask him what you should do. Or maybe ask him what's going to happen. You go to Samuel. He's the man of God there, the minister. These prophets are a little funkier than that. These are the, this is the worship prophets. <laughs> I've seen Avatar Last Airbender. You remember the episode when they're trying to get under the tunnels to Ba Sing Se? And there's that little group singing, you know, secret tunnels. You know, it's, 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 These guys, I think, got some of that vibes going on. Uh, they are worshiping prophets. So, when Saul meets them, they're, they're accompanied by all these instruments. So, they're clearly worshiping and praising God. That's what their prophecy is about. Prophecy isn't just about what we say to one another. But even as we read the Psalms, as they're worshiping God in the Psalms, it's also prophecy unto us. It's the word of the Lord. And that's the kind of thing that these guys were into. So, when Saul meets them... The Spirit of God that they're sharing in rushes upon him to empower him to do what? To prophesy also. So Saul begins to sing and worship unto the Lord. When Samuel sends him away, he said, you're going to become a different man. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Saul was saved, that he was regenerated? Well, we're going to have to keep our, going in our study to find out if Saul is, has been a, changed into a believer. But here, he's definitely been changed in a way. Saul is not known for being the singy, the singy prophecy type of guy. Because when everybody saw him, who knew him, they're like, yo, what's gotten into Saul? Is Saul also among the prophets? And then another guy in the place answered, well, who's their, who's their father? It's Saul, son of Kish. And it became, a pro, uh, it became a proverb there. Is Saul among the prophets? Uh, this is kind of a nice one. I hope this can become current in our church. This is a good one to use. So uh, what, is, what does it mean, uh, Saul also among the prophets? So they didn't expect Saul to be a prophet. And I think that's really the context of Samuel telling him, you'll become a different man. The Spirit of God rushing upon him would change the way he was vibing, and he was going to now be involved in this prophecy business. The expression, the proverb, means uh, if, you, if, if two people or two groups get together that you wouldn't expect, you would say, is Saul also among the prophets? So, uh, it's a couple of great music artists have done this throughout the ages. Uh, a great 80s musical artist, Phil Collins, you know, dominated the 80s with his electronic and drum singing and all that. Uh, and then a much different group came along later in the 90s, Bone Thugs and Harmony. But if someone from ancient Israel was watching MTV in the early 2000s, they, this video would have come on. They would have pinched themselves. They didn't know if they were dreaming because you had Bone Thugs and Harmony with Phil Collins together in a song. 
and you just didn't know if they were tripping or if that was real, you know. And uh, and they did do a, a duet together, and that was unexpected. And the members of Bone Thug said, you know, they call him Phil Bone now. It wasn't expected. They, you know, is Phil also among the bones? Right. <laughs> That's kind of the way it is. This is used. All right. Uh, is Saul also among the prophets? You see people that. Another example. I was uh, in Denver this week at ETS. And uh, our dear beloved brother Adam Shanahan goes to Davenant Institute, which is really smart people, right? And so I'm meeting these guys, me, Luke Walker. I'm like, yeah, I'm Adam's pastor, and they're just not even computing. This is not what they expected. <laughs> so that's a good proverb there. But this is not how Saul would usually rock it out. This was different. He had been changed in a way. And he's worshiping and praising God. He wasn't known for that. And that's Saul the prophet. Okay, let's switch gears. So after that happens, he spends like seven days doing that, worshiping, I guess, waiting. And then Samuel calls all the people together at Mizpah. That's close to where he had set up the Ebenezer stone. So they've been, they've been here, place of remembrance. Samuel calls the people together and he rebukes them again. He tells them, the Lord, thus says the Lord, I saved you out of Egypt by my hand. I've saved you from all your enemies all around you. I'm constantly saving you, protecting you from your foes. And yet you've rejected me and said, give us a king like all the other people. So that's what's going to happen. And Samuel's rebuking them as he does that. So there's kind of this balance there where Samuel affirms Saul. He blesses Saul. He kisses Saul. Uh, but at the same time, as far as the people are concerned, he rebukes them and keeps warning them that this is what they asked for and this is what they're going to get. So, so they go through this uh, thing where they cast lots, basically rolling the dice or drawing straws or whatever to see who's picked. And so they, 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 roll, they roll the dice and boom, it's the tribe of Benjamin. Roll the dice again, boom, it's a mat matrites or whatever. And then eventually is down to the household of Kish and to Saul. Saul's the one who's chosen. And everyone looks around, they, he's not there. They can't find him. So uh, they're like, is there somebody else coming? What's happening? And the Lord says he's hiding among the baggage. I guess like Adam hiding amongst the trees of the garden. He's not up to task. And so even though Saul looks the part... And this is the whole point. He looks the part of a mighty king and ruler. Inwardly, he's really not that guy. He's not the guy who's going there. He's scared. And not in a good way. It's not like he's being humble here, maybe. But he's just apprehensive. And he doesn't really have that leader's heart, as we'll see in his life. Okay, so. He's chosen as king. He's and all the people say, long live the king. The King James reads, God save the king. It's pretty raw. So... That's what happens, and then everyone goes to their homes. But then Saul's given a chance to, uh, to put it into action and to save the people. So immediately what happens is, everyone's went back to their homes, Saul's back, he's just plowing oxen, he's going on with his normal life. But one of the cities of Israel crossed the Jordan to the east, had been attacked by Nahash the Ammonite, uh, one of their foe kings from the east. And he came to them and struck with them a deal they couldn't refuse. He said to them, you know, he's going to conquer them. He draws up against them. And they said, let's make a treaty. Let's make a treaty, a peace treaty. We'll, we'll serve you. Just have mercy on us and let us live. He says, this is the treaty or covenant I'll make with you. I'm taking out the right eye from all your men to bring disgrace upon Israel. And that'll be the treaty. Take all the right eyes are mine, and then I'll let you live, live your life. Well, that's not a very nice situation. Have you ever imagined having your right eye plucked out? You know? Well, there's not a man here who wouldn't give his right eye to protect and save those he loves. So, really, they're ready to do it, these men here. But they don't want to do it. Who would want that? You know what I'm saying? Um, it's a shameful thing, and it's a painful thing. And it would leave them, well... My guy, Alexander Wade, my co-host on Merrill Ministries podcast, you know, only one of his eyes works. So you're left like with Wade, you know. <laughs> it's a tough, we always roast him, all right. Um, so they're, 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 they're in a bad way. 
And so they say, give us, give us some time to think about it, and we're going to see if anyone can help us. So they send out the word throughout Israel. And when Saul hears it, the Spirit of God rushes upon him for a second time and empowers him, this time, not to prophesy and worship God, but to save and deliver the people. It says that when the Spirit came upon him, that his anger was greatly kindled. So this is like judges' language. This is what happened to the judges. The Spirit would rush upon them like, you know, this is uh, Samson. This is exactly what would happen to him. Boom. And he would go into this rage and totally obliterate the enemy. That's what happened with Saul here. Uh, but it's God's doing to empower him even though Saul is not the nicest guy about it. So what does he do? He's got these oxen. He's just coming in from the field. So he cuts them up into pieces, sends the pieces of the cows all throughout Israel, and says, whoever doesn't come out to help me fight, I'm going to cut up his oxen in the same way. So it's really a threat. So already, remember what Samuel had told them. If you get a king, he's going to be harsh over you. He's going to take all your stuff. And so already in this first deliverance of Saul, it's already starting to manifest. He's leading them in this harsh way. And they're terrified. They're, they, it says they have the dread of the Lord. That's true, but it's through the harsh hand of Saul. So, but anyway, they listen. And they come out, and they march, and they save the city from the hand of the Ammonites. And totally obliterate them, bring salvation, and the people rejoice. So... So that's really it for Saul's first day on the job as king. He prophesies and worships unto God, and then he also does his first act of corporate salvation and delivers the people very successfully, blessed by God, from the hand of their enemies. And that's, that's the passage. Okay, so now let's switch gears and consider how this might apply to us here today. How does this relate to us where we are. Four applications. First, God uses the imperfect people in our lives. So, um, Samuel's rebuking the people. They want a king like all the other nations. But it's still God who chooses their king. The Lord is the one that chose Saul and gave him to them. And when Saul was anointed as king, some mighty men of valor, they were moved by God, and they joined themselves with Saul, and they served him with their might. But it says, other worthless fellows uh, mocked Saul and said, how, how can this man save us from our enemies? There's no way he can do it. Now Saul held his peace about that. But you see this different reaction. And it's sort of complicated here, all right? Because is Saul a good choice to be king? Well, no, he's not, but yet he's God's choice. And God said, he will save you. I will use him to save you. And those worthless fellows were questioning that. Could this man really save us? So it's this fine line here of him being not the best choice, and yet God called the people to submit to that choice and to trust God through that choice that he would do what he said he was going to do. So that application is, 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 is for us today, is that God uses the imperfect people in our lives. I mean, there's nothing but imperfect people in our lives. Those who have positions of authority over us, right? Our parents, our guardians, our employers, our teachers at school. All those positions of authority, they're not... It's not perfect people. Oftentimes, it's not even Christian people. But does that mean that we should act like these worthless fellows and say, well, what could they even do to us? Rather, we should recognize that God is the one who has appointed those people in our lives. And it's His sovereign will. And if we are where God wants us to be, and we're not in a sinful place, and we're not disobeying Him, and we're, we're walking in His will as much as we can, then we can have peace about the people that are over us that don't have it all together. We will have to be careful about being hypercritical about that. But rather we should seek their good, like David, I mean like Daniel in Babylon. He's going to submit to that. He's going to seek the good of the city where he is, even though it's not an ideal situation, and even though they're not godly people. So us in our, in our workplaces and even in our homes where there's imperf imperfection here and unchristian character and behavior there, what's our duty there? I mean, we have to submit. And we have to recognize that, Lord, I can trust you through this because you have set this up for whatever reasons you have. And I can trust you in this and move forward. 
Now, the flip side of that is that we are also the imperfect people in other people's lives, right? That's the same thing for us. Uh, we're not perfect in our positions of authority, those of us who are parents, those of us who have authority in the workplace. We're not perfect. We have many flaws and many weaknesses. And so, even as we give mercy to those over us who are imperfect, we have to remember that those under us have to give us mercy too. Children have to give mercy to parents. And that's one of the best things we can do as parents is apologize to our kids and ask to repent well and ask for mercy. They see, they know. We can't cover it up. They understand those things. So it's one of the very best things we can do. So that's just first application. You see that structure there. There's that balance. Just because somebody might be ungodly personally, but if God has them in a position of authority, it's like, okay, I'm going to honor that as best I can for His glory. Second application. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is the true worshiping prophet, Savior King. So <laughs> this is what Saul was here. There's this whole conglomerate together. So he's anointed as king, and then he gets two anointings of God's Spirit. One, as a prophet, to prophesy. Two, as a savior, to deliver the people. It's that double-sided anointing. And this is what Jesus fulfills perfectly and is in all his immense glory. We're imperfect. The people in our lives are imperfect. Christians are imperfect to each other. However, Jesus, our mighty savior, is actually perfect. He's actually never done us wrong. He's never steered us wrong. He's never done us dirty. He's never dealt us the smallest injustice. He's always done all things well for us. And he fulfills this in his life and in his ministry. There's the two parts, the worshiping prophet. <laughs> uh, this is what makes Jesus godly, is that he was primarily and first a worshiper of God. As a man, the second person of the Trinity, lives a human life in submission to God the Father, and he's totally captivated by God. He stays up all night in prayer just to get that time in with his Heavenly Father. He's, his whole life is animated by the impulse of thinking of God, adoring God, expressing praise and worship to God. And even now, when he died and rose again and went on high, He's now our great worship leader, and he sings to God in the midst of his brothers and sisters. And that's what heaven will be in so many ways, is Christ leading us in worship unto God. He is that. And when Jesus worships as worship prophet, nobody says, is he also among the prophets? I mean, it's, it fits. He's the prophet. He is the worshiper, Christ. And he's also our Savior King. He also delivers us. You know, you might think that's soft if he's just on the praise and worship team. What kind of king is that? It's a little soft. Well, he's also the deliverer of his people. He's also filled with holy zeal to save us from all our enemies. So Jesus, the spirit-filled man, is he who worships God continuously and he who gave his own life to save us from all our spiritual and true enemies. He is that perfectly. So even in Saul's imperfection, we can see the shadow and figure of our perfect Savior Christ. Okay, that's the second application. Third application. Jesus saves and summons us with sweetness, unlike Saul. Saul's harsh here. He's threatening to take everybody's stuff and cut it up and waste the cattle if they won't come out and serve him. That's, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, it's, it might be a good way to get, a, get something done. You know, those of us, when you're a parent, you might, I'm just going to be super harsh to try to get the kids to do the thing, but that's not really what it's about. Christ is so much different than Saul here. David is also this way, sweet and tender with the people. And when he saves us, and summons us into battle to serve with him, he does it in a sweet and a gentle way. It doesn't come with his threats. You know? Christ will come and judge the world. He will come and, and wreck shop with the nations. But when he comes to someone to save them, he woos them with his sweet and tender mercies. And that's his disposition toward us. That's the way he is toward us always as believers. He comes to us, He saves us in that way, and He keeps us in that way. 
We get into trouble when we start to think that Christ is more like Saul, harsh, that he's threatening you, that he's going to take that stuff away, that he's, going to, he's just going to tear your life apart if you don't get everything together and serve him front and center in the Christian army. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you don't obey him perfectly and get this together, that it's over. That's how we think by nature, because we're used to leaders like Saul. That's the type of leaders we would be. But Jesus is totally different, you know. When He delivers us from our enemies, and when He calls us to serve Him, which He does, follow me, He says. He does it with tenderness and with, with encouragement. He's already paid that price. There's no need for oxen to be cut up. He was already pierced for our transgressions. We don't pay for that. He paid for that. It's already done. And He encourages us with His finished work to come follow Him. It's already done. We're already victorious in Christ. Now we're free to serve Him, to fight the spiritual battles alongside our King, to obey His commandments. We're free to do that now. And there's nobody that encourages us as sweetly as Christ does. So when you feel that condemnation, you feel that discouragement, you feel that judgment hanging over you as a Christian, that's not Christ. If you're playing games with Christ, yes. You know what I'm saying? If you're putting him off and just kind of giving lip service to him, but you're not really in submission to him, don't play. He is the Lion of Judah and he's coming back. But for those who have trusted in him, he's always this towards us. Praise the Lord. And we can be encouraged by that. Fourth application and last one. He anoints everyone who calls on him with the Spirit of God. Okay, so I titled the sermon, Better Call Saul. Because uh, <laughs> that's, what that's what they need to do when they were in trouble. So. <laughs> but when you call Saul, <laughs> it's, you know, it's going to be hit or miss. You don't really quite know what you're going to get with Saul the king and Saul Goodman too. Same difference. Um, but with Christ, it's different. When we call upon Christ... He, he not, not only comes and, and saves us by His power, and He's the Anointed One, but then we share in that with Him. We participate with Him. We get the anointing also in Him. When we trust in Christ, when we call on Him to save us, He delivers us in an amazing way where He delivers us truly like He does the work on our hearts. He changes us at the deepest place of who we are and we participate in the anointed Spirit of God in that. So, why did the Spirit come upon Saul? It was to empower him. In this case, to do two things. Empower him to worship God. He wasn't, he wasn't the type of guy he was. So he needed the Spirit of God to empower him to worship. And he needed the Spirit of God to empower him to save. And this is reflected in our lives too. As many of you that are Christians, you have participated in the anointing of the Spirit. You have the Spirit within you. And He empowers you in these two ways as well. To be a true worshiper of God and to participate in the battle against our enemies. Our battle is not like this, where we have to save people physically from physical enemies. That could happen in life. But for every Christian, the battle is spiritual against our spiritual enemies against sin and Satan and his foes. And we do participate in that fight, y'all. We do wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We wage the good war. We fight the good fight of faith. That's part of the Christian life. And we can't do that on our own. You know, you come to church in, in the morning like today and you think, how are you going to stir up the, the proper mentality and emotions to worship God? Here we are, we're singing songs unto God. You need the Spirit of God to do that. We all do. When, you're, when you wake up tomorrow and you're going to work, even though it's a short week, hopefully for everybody, still, you've got to wake up, you've got to face that day. It's not easy to worship and praise God when you're facing difficult things, when it's real life. We need the Spirit of God to empower us, and that's what we have in Christ. He empowers us to be true worshipers of God. What is that about? It's not just about the outward. Here they were outwardly singing and stuff, but where does that start? It starts in our minds. To be mindful of God. To think about Him. To search out His glory and His truth. To be taken captive by immense thoughts of our great God. 
We study to know Him. And as we do that, our hearts are brought in with that. And we begin to feel affections for God. And we worship Him <laughs> in our lives. And then we begin to do whatever we do for Him. Because we're mindful of Him. We're thankful for what He's done for us. <laughs> so we become worshipers. And then we also wage war with Christ our King. He calls us to stand next to Him, to fight in the battles with Him. As we fight, He's fighting with us. As we fight our own sin, as we lock arms with brothers and sisters in Christ to help them fight their sin. And to press on. To press on against their doubts, against their struggles, against difficult situations in life. We have to help each other with that. We're called, we're summoned to that. Jesus does call us to do that. But we get to do it with His presence. His smiling presence is always with us. So every Christian is equipped to fight sin and to help other Christians too. Because we participate in the Spirit together with our great King. And we wage that war. And this will all reach a crescendo. I mean, this is a reality now. But one day, this reality will just be manifested. It says that Jesus will come back on the clouds of heaven and His holy ones will ride with Him. Paul says that we too will judge the world. We will judge angels with Him. We saw last week, we sit with Christ on His throne, and one day we will share in His cosmic rule. So what will heaven be when God remakes this world and takes away all bad things out of it, all pain, suffering, sin, evil, temptation is gone out of all of it? What will it be? It will be us worshiping God and reigning over His creation together with Him. We become kings and queens, rulers, with Him. Royal priesthood together with Christ. And that will be our eternities. It's all very amazing stuff. Maybe for some of you guys it sounds far off. Sounds like it's not real. How could that possibly be real? Maybe for some of you guys it seems like my sin is too great. There's no way that Jesus would instantly turn me into a fellow ruler with Him in His kingdom. Well, it's true. He will. Because He paid the price. Because He died for us. He did all of it. So that it's a free gift for the unworthy, for the imperfect, for the sinful, for the rebels. By trusting in Jesus, He saves us completely right now. And we share in His anointing. Okay, let's pray. Father, may Your truth ring true in our hearts. May we thank You for the gift of your spirit that you live in our hearts that you're with us always that you're changing us every day to think and to feel more like Christ I pray that you would empower us this week to be worshipers in whatever we do and to fight the fight of faith against our sins and temptations, against our doubts and ungodly fears, and also to help other believers do the same, and to invite everybody to become members of this glorious heavenly kingdom. Bless it now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.